Hello, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the amazing presentation before. Thank Ben was awesome. That guy has so much energy. Like, if we hook you up to like a gerbil wheel and a generator, we could power Canada for like months. But um, <laughs> so I need everyone to do something for me right away because yesterday my friend Rod came up and he started talking immediately about, oh, I'm so nervous. And then I'm sitting in the audience thinking, I'm going to be nervous too, and that's going to be awful for everybody. So I need everyone to help me out. Right before we do anything else, this is very technical, so I need you to watch me. All right. On the count of three, I'm going to give you a count of three, and everyone is going to do this for me. <laughs> okay. If you uh, on the count of three, count of three. Listen. All right. This is science. All right. <laughs> One, two, three. Thank you. All right. So thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Um, thank you, Jason and, and Rajam. And, and thank you to my wife for getting, this, getting me to get this presentation done on time, because I'm not good at many things, but procrastination, awesome. Um, so <laughs> today we're going to talk about talking. We're going to talk about communication. Um, I've had great conversations with a lot of you already this, this weekend and before, and this kept coming up. How do we talk about this stuff, right? And here's the scenario. You, a lot of you I know, this is like your first conference. You're kind of getting involved, or you've been involved, but you're really branching out at this point. You're getting all kinds of amazing information. You're excited to, to bring it back to the clinic or wherever you might work, and you get there, and you start talking about it, and nothing, right? No, people are giving you blank stares or they're looking at you kind of crazy. Like, what are, what are you talking about? What is this stuff? What good is this information if we can't convey it? If we can't convey it to the people that we work with, convey it to people that might refer to us or that we refer to, and certainly not to the patients that we're working with or the clients, right? So what good is this information if no one is listening? This seems to be a vital part of, of the entire weekend. This is said at least in half the presentations, so let's talk about that. So before I begin, something kind of funny happened. So I put together this presentation, and I'm getting ready to get on the plane to come over here, and I come across an article, and it was fascinating. And I'd never thought of this particular topic before and how it related to what we were going to talk about today. And I, I went, oh my god, this changes everything. And I had to change all my slides and rearrange everything. And it was really amazing because it was brand new up to the minute kind of stuff. And I think you guys will really appreciate it. Now, I'm not going to tell you just yet. Otherwise, I'd be like, Ben, just like, here's the one slide. OK, good night. But I hope that when we get there, you'll really find this fascinating, too, because I certainly did. And I think this changes almost everything about what we think about in communication. So who am I? Uh, I'm an orthopedic physical therapist. Uh, I work outside of uh, Philadelphia in Jenkintown and Excel Physical Therapy. Great clinic. Anyone needs a job, come talk to me. Good stuff. Um, before that, I was a personal trainer and strength coach, so kind of like Rod's background, actually. Uh, that picture is of me and my wife when we first met, when I had a better hairline. Um, for five years, I worked for this gentleman. This is His Royal Highness Prince Aulid bin Talal bin Abdulaziz Al Saud. Uh, he is the nephew of the Saudi king. I lived in Saudi Arabia for five years. Um, if you see that little bike ride that we're doing there, that's me sitting there with that, that stupid look on my face. Um, <laughs> if you notice, like if you've ever been to Paris, you know how the Parisians feel about cyclists and people walking on their streets. They definitely don't like a group of bicyclists going down the wrong way on the Champs Elysees following a truck full of photographers taking a photo op. Uh, if, if pictures had sound, it would be amazing. So when I was there in Saudi Arabia, this is where I first came across this type of information. And it was fascinating, right? I mean, this, this was the key in many ways. So the, the problems that I had had in clinic before, the patients that just didn't seem to get better. And I was so excited about it, and I wanted to tell the world about it, right? Like many of you. I wanted to spread the good word. I wanted to be the Jedi Knight of pain science. Didn't really work out that way, because <laughs> I kind of fell to the dark side. Um, I'm that guy. I've probably pissed off at least a good portion of you here, and I am sorry. I just started arguing. That's all that ended up happening. 
And instead of trying to get out this good message, I was being met with resistance. And in that resistance, I was resisting back. And it becomes arguments and flame wars and these big, long, you know, Facebook shouts and matches and this craziness. And I was getting a lot of high fives from people, but I was also getting a lot of high ones, you know? <laughs> and it, this wasn't what I wanted to do, right? This wasn't the, the aim of my message, and yet some, for some reason, it just wasn't working. So what was happening? And that's where I started to think more about how I was communicating and what I was actually doing in the first place. So we don't want to troll. We don't want to mess with people's good time, right? But we need to get this message across. So how do we do that? Can't we just all come riding in on our unicorns, shooting rainbows out of our hands or wherever, right? So that's who I am. And I want to tell you who I'm not. I'm not a psychologist, and I'm not a sociologist. I'm not a neuroscientist, and I'm not a researcher. What I am is a clinician. And I'm like most of us here, right? So I'm trying to find better answers to the problems that are affecting us in the clinic. I've done my best to try to put together a nice presentation, to look at the research, and we're going to look at a whole bunch of it. But I may be missing something. Or in some of my messaging, you might say, you know what, that doesn't, I've done different stuff. That doesn't work for me. And that's awesome. And I want to put that out there right now. We have a really, we'll have a Q&A after this. We're going to have a conversation with a whole bunch of us at the, the end of the day here. And your experiences would be awesome. And if it doesn't fit, let's see if we can make it fit. Let's see if there's something that, that you can bring to the table as well that just kind of puts all this stuff together. Because at the end of the day, we're going to go home and we're going to be faced with the same problem. How do I get people to listen to what I have to say? Right. So why should this be important at all? Right? I mean, we're assuming it's important, but why is it? So, Data supports the need for frequent, high-quality communication and strong relationships among healthcare providers to maximize the quality of care, improve the efficiency of care, and improve clinical outcome. Healthcare providers, that's the spectrum. We need to communicate with everyone, from the patient to the referral, from the highest to the lowest. Anyone in this room is part of this, and we need to be part of this, too. We need to start creating better allegiances and alliances because Patients, we've all had that before. A patient or a client comes in, you say one thing, but you know, this person said something else, and there's confusion. Confusion doesn't help anybody. General trust exhibits a strong positive association with satisfaction, trust in one's physician, and following doctor's recommendations, and a strong negative association with prior disputes with physicians, having sought second opinions, and having changed physicians. Right? So this goes all the way up. What we do here today affects everyone. And if we can get that message across, we don't just help ourselves, we help everyone. And in turn, we ultimately help the patient. Physiotherapists, for all you non-US therapists, physiotherapists are in a position to change inaccurate beliefs about the pathology of the problem, reduce anxiety, thereby increasing self-efficacy in combating depression. If physiotherapists can recognize these opportunities and develop the skills required to facilitate the use of basic cognitive principles in the treatment of physical disabilities, there's benefit for both therapist and patient. Have we heard this before this week? And this sounds like stuff we want to do, right? Pain neuroscience education intends to provide compelling experiences convincing the individual that there is less threat than they previously considered, while also providing optimism for improved pain and function. This task becomes difficult for the educator when the messages are contrary to what the learner has been taught by others about pain. We've heard this too. Dr. O'Sullivan was talking about this. And we all know this probably through experience. This stuff is great, but not if the patient is already primed to believe something else. But we can stop that if we can get through to those that they're seeing first. Because for most of us here, if not all of us, we're probably not the first person that they're going to see for their treatment. Right? They've gone other places. Even if it's just the referral source, there are still messages that are being provided. And we can, start, we can do a better job if we start sooner. So presumably experiencing or anticipating cognitive dissonance, there it is, motivates people to defend themselves by seeking more congenial than uncongenial information, information that's good rather than information that doesn't feel good. Hence, factors that, in, that enhance the experience or anticipation of cognitive dissonance 
should strengthen defense motivation and in turn accentuate the congeniality bias. Isn't this what we're up against, right? A confirmation bias. When we try to have a conversation with someone, are we met with resistance? That resistance is called con uh, congeniality bias. They know what they know and they don't want to hear something new. So how do we prevent this? How do we stop it? Who is most likely to demonstrate cognitive dissonance? All right, know the enemy. So this is crazy paper that I found, I dug up out of nowhere. Um, pain science supporters comparing biomedical, we have lower intelligence, reduced willingness to, oh my God. All right, so <laughs> don't go drinking with Rod and then try to make a slide up. <laughs> That's ridiculous. All right, if any, uh, I, I, my apologies. If anyone needs this, I'll make sure it's, it's corrected before, before we get out of here. Um, but anyway, so, People sometimes respond more intensely, that's awful, uh, to threatening information that disconfirms their desired view than to congenial information that confirms it. Um, I'm gonna go back, you know what, let's go back to that though. Let's, let's use it, right? So I'm gonna go back to the, the, the previous slide there. Um, would it have looked better if it looked like that? Right? That was your confirmation bias. And I can tell you about it, but I can make you feel it too. We all have an understanding of what we are. We're intelligent, we're smart, we're the leaders. And I just told you, you weren't. Did anyone here go, oh goodness, this is wonderful, I get to learn more about myself? Or did you go, what the fuck? right? <laughs> That's confirmation bias. It doesn't happen to those people, it happens to all of us. It's the human condition. It's what we do. And if we have someone that's disagreeing with us and we, well, that they're, they're biased, we're shutting down communication. And more importantly, we're, not, we're being disingenuous because we do the same things. So we're all of this. The battle isn't from the outside, the battle is inside. Because if we can overcome ours, then we can overcome someone else's. All right. Now, I'm gonna point out that I did give you a clue that this was a fake slide. Right there, cats. Um, those are the authors. Right? Because every presentation should have cats. Um, <laughs> so, who is most likely to demonstrate cognitive dissonance? It's us. It's everyone. There's no one that is more likely or less likely. We all have the potential to show this bias, to show cognitive dissonance, to say, I don't like that information, so I'm going to find a reason not to like it, to say that that's wrong. That's us, that's them, that's everybody, all right? So let's talk a little bit more about this. Um, dissonance theory, faced with a difficult decision between equally attractive alternatives, people who often adjust their attitudes to support their choice. We demonstrate the processes associated with decision-related attitude change are engaged even when making numerous decisions in quick succession over a relatively short period of time. What does this mean? It means that this is Automatic. We're not thinking about it. None of us think, thought, hmm, I should think about whether or not to trust that slide. It just happens. It's a reaction. And the people that we talk to are just having natural, normal reaction. It's very easy to think, they're closed-minded. They don't want to hear about this. It's not conscious. It's that, huh? That jolt is the cognitive dissonance. And then you seek to make it consistent with yourself. Your worldview, your values, your beliefs about yourself, about what you do, versus this information. And it's like that. I'm not going to read that slide. But all I wanted to, to show is that this is normal activity in the brain. Right? This is, this is pain, right? It's activity in the brain. We're not deciding to be against information. It's happening. It's just happening naturally. So the majority of dissonance research is considered situations involving inconsistencies that clearly pertain to behavior. Dissonance also results from inconsistencies between perceptions or values. The model posits that these cognitions often have urgent, immediate action implications. Isn't it all about values? Right? What's the things that we hear when we talk about pain signs to people? Are you, you're saying I don't help people? Right? You're saying what I do is wrong? Aren't they talking about their values as practitioners, as health advisors, therapists, or a patient? Are you saying my pain isn't real? 
Right? We're not saying that. We're not trying to say that. But isn't that what they're hearing? Because they're accessing the things that matter the most to them. Are these things under threat? Are my values under threat? And if they think that it is, the conversation is done. So defense motivation is the desire to defend one's existing attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. Accuracy motivation is the desire to form accurate appraisals of stimuli. So there, there are choices here. We can be defensive, but we can also seek accuracy. It's not an automatic in the sense of it's always defensive, right? We've all probably come here from different initial educations and, and experiences, but at one point, each and every one of us sought greater accuracy. And that allowed us to overcome that bias within ourselves to what we might have learned before, to what we believed, to throw away almost everything in some cases and start fresh because we sought accuracy. So studies showed that selection favored congenial information when the congenial information was useful, but favored uncongenial information when the uncongenial information was useful. Less supportive of the role of accuracy motivation and selective exposure were associations involving information quality and outcome relevance. Isn't that what we do? Oh, here's a paper. So you're wrong. Who cares? Because that's not what motivates people to use information that they would otherwise not like. The accuracy of that information doesn't matter. But can I use that information? That matters. So do I feel good about my approach in clinic? Do I solve everyone's problems or have a reason to believe that I do? Or do I have problems with the way that I treat? Do I have patients that I couldn't figure out why they weren't getting better even though I was doing everything right? That's useful. Selecting congenial information can facilitate feeling validated about one's view or even maintaining stable views of the world, but may reduce accuracy and flexibility. Hence, the occasionally opposing influences of defense and accuracy motivation create a balance between defending prior views and obtaining realistic views of an object or issue. It's a battle that goes on in all of us. It goes on with them, it goes on with us. And what, where we are at that moment, on that topic, in that environment, may change that, that battle in t to favor one side or the other. And again, it's automatic. It's all happening immediately. So how do you do this? That all sounds great, but how do you do it? I've actually already showed you. So let's take a look back. Factors that enhance the experience or anticipation of cognitive dissonance should strengthen defense motivation and turn accentuate congeniality bias. We start here. We start with the understanding that I might get pushback. Whenever I start in a conversation and whenever I try to engage in communication, I should immediately recognize the fact that I might get pushback and that can be okay. I have to know that this is automatic, that this is something that happens to everyone. It's not a bad thing, it's not a, a closed-minded person, it's just natural. And if I start there, I can, I can make this less dangerous to myself. I can lower my resistance to their resistance. Pain neuroscience education tends to provide compelling experiences, convincing the individual that there is less threat. Now, less threat, we do this already, right? Don't we try to engage our patients, show them that there's less threat? Can we engage our peers and show them that there's no threat to our information? Can we convince others not of the accuracy of our information, but of the congeniality of it? Why it can be helpful, why it can be useful, why it is not threatening. And I think that that's an important point. We think of painful movement as sensitized or guarded movement. Can we think of cognitive dissonance as sensitized or guarded beliefs? Would we treat someone in pain as, well, you're closed-minded. You shouldn't have pain. You should be listening to me. Anyone do that? So why do we do that to people that argue with us? Oh, I can't talk to you. You're closed-minded, right? So treat communication like you treat movement. We've seen the IASP definition. It's an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. What if we talked about dissonance as an unpleasant cognitive and emotional experience associated with actual or potential social or self-identity damage or described in terms of such damage? 
Does that reframe the concept? Do we look at it differently now? We're healers, right? This is what we do. So let's heal. Let's not heal in this situation, but harm in that one. Let's be consistent with our values. Because if we're consistent with values, we lower our own cognitive dissonance. And if we do that, we create safe environments for other people to express their ideas and to have an idea expressed and communicated back and forth. So the data supports the need for frequent high quality communication and strong relationships among healthcare providers, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> this is where we stop. This must be the goal. Not to be right. Not to say your information is wrong but to create frequent, high-quality communication and strong relationships. Because if we do that, we have opportunity. If we don't do that, we have chaos, poor patient outcomes. We, have, we cut off avenues of opportunity to discuss, to learn, both ways. Right? Not to be right, but to be better, to be accurate. And if we demonstrate that willingness to be accurate, Others will demonstrate that willingness back. So I did this to you today. right? When I came to this slide, I told you what I wasn't. I didn't come up here and say, look at me. I'm, I'm talking in front of you guys. I was silly. And I showed you what I wasn't. I offered you my weaknesses to trust me, to realize that we're all the same. I'm standing up here. You guys are down there. Next year, it'll be in reverse. And we're all good at what we do, right? I talked about my history, how I'm such a bastard, right? <laughs> and I was open about it. And I invited you, if you have different ideas, let them be known, right? Let's talk about it. Let's see if we can actually fit them together. What seems like it wouldn't work, maybe it does. Maybe what you're doing is kind of similar to what I'm saying. And we just need to reframe it and look at it in a different way. We don't need to come up and argue, no, no, that doesn't work. No, that, I saw another paper. That doesn't do anything. It doesn't solve any problems at all. We can be that unicorn riding, rainbow shooting, awesome person. <laughs> so choose your battles. How do we educate and how do we not alienate? Not all adult learners are equally intrinsically motivated. In fact, there necessarily arises the need of a mix of learning strategies, ranging from teacher-directed to student-directed learning. This implies that there needs to be a match between the learner and the teaching styles used. What if the people we're talking to are all willing to listen, but we're not communicating properly? That's not their problem. That's ours. Right? We need to match our style. We need to recognize where that person is and how to do that. Most important step to clinch such dynamic relationships is to carry out a needs assessment of the student or trainees involved. For example, whereas in the first clinical attachment, students would be dependent on the teacher to show them how to take a history, going on further along the months to discussing the differential diagnosis and treatment of the patient's symptoms. Don't we do this in reverse when we start to educate? Do we talk about, hey, you know, I do this really cool stuff in clinic. I, I'm really trying to access what the patient values because I find that it helps them to do more exercise or to accept the treatment or, you know, and I can, we could talk about it if you're really interested. Or do we come in, pain is a biopsychosocial concept and you're wrong, right? We don't give them tools. We don't make our information useful. What we do is we blast them with facts. But we just saw that facts don't matter. If it's not useful, it's discarded. Because if, it doesn't, if it's not useful, it's going to threaten my worldview and the things that I already do, the things that I'm comfortable with. So we need to reverse this. We need to show what we do. We need to talk about what we do, not why we do it. Who cares? Let's worry about that later. Dr. O'Sullivan said the same thing. He said, OK, I know all this stuff. I don't talk about it. I don't tell the patient about it. I just get them to move. And I know in the back of my head what's going on, but they don't need to. And the patients respond, why? Because they find it useful. If they come to you and you talk all about this science, is it useful to them? Maybe, sometimes, to the right person, in the right situation, but not always. And I do it. I, I make that mistake. So 
And what this slide shows is this idea of teacher styles versus learning stages. We have dependent learners, interested learners, involved learners, and self-directed learners. And on the top, we have the, the authority, the expert, a salesperson and a motivator, a facilitator, facilitator and a delegator. And what I chose to do is to look at those bottom corners there. Because aren't all of you involved? You're here. You're self-directed. You guys read papers or read books, right? So I don't need to come up here and talk on this high level of what's going on. I passed that slide. I just said, hey, here, look, it works in the brain. But I want to give you opportunities to then direct this, your own learning for yourself, because you're there. You're ready for that. But a patient that comes through your door or the physician that hasn't asked to learn about any of this, are they self-directed learning learners in, in this information? We need to make sure that we're giving the right type of information and approach for the right type of situation. And that's just the same thing that we do with patients. Some are real high level. Some have a lot of impairments and dysfunctions and things that we have to work with first. Match your approach to the person you're talking to. Now, trans theoretical model of behavior change, I put this slide up here. This is not without controversy. So I don't want you to take this away as being scientifically accurate. The, there's a world of research behind it. Some things show benefit to this approach and some things don't. But I did want to put it up for the single reason that behavior change as a process that unfolds over time and involves progress through a series of stages. And there are different models that we'll talk about different stages and we could go backwards and forwards in those stages. But there is an idea here that what do we think about when we come up against you know, a, a pushback, we think they're closed-minded. And then we become closed-minded to their ability to change, and we shut the door. But this shows us that that may not be the case. And someone giving you pushback today may be at your door six months going, so what, what were you talking about? Right? So we can think of this not as someone being closed-minded, but someone that may not be in a position to change. Pre-contemplation by this model talks about no recognition of need for change. Would you change if you didn't think you needed to? Of course not. Now, the secret sauce. I promised this to you before. What was the paper that I found that changed everything? It was curiosity. You see what I did there? All right. Scientific curiosity changes the way that people look at information, not scientific knowledge scientific curiosity. By presenting gaps in knowledge to students, they will, according to the information gap theory, become motivated to find the answers and will have to actively inquire into the subject in order to resolve their curiosity. So we just talked about don't push into people's lives with information they're not ready for, right? We talked about matching your education to the, to the listener. But what if you didn't do any of that? What if they came to you? Doesn't that make for a much easier methodology? What if instead of telling them what they should believe, compel them to ask the question of, why do you do what you do? Isn't that much easier? Isn't that much more efficient? They're coming to you. So we've already knocked off some of those dependent learner type of, of slides right away. They're here to say, I'm finding something interesting in what you're doing. And we have opportunity in every interaction to do that. The psychological research suggests that when the gap is relatively small, curiosity is maximized. The consequence of this is that there is no point presenting problems that are very difficult or involve large amounts of new learning. So we're not trying to tell them that the earth is flat. Right? We're not trying to change everything because that gets pushed back. Right? If, if you think that everything that you do is wrong, you're going to guard the hell out of that. But if you're curious about this, you know, there's this one patient, and I'm, they're getting better, but there's, I just can't get them better? That's a small curiosity. What's the difference here? And if you're doing work or talking about things that seem to address that very condition or that very thing, that's a small gap that they can fill. And they do so freely without defense. So this was the actual paper that, that caught my attention. And it's actually about politics, which is interesting enough. Because isn't this all essentially politics in one way or another? 
the different health professions and your turf and my turf and what I do and what you do. And what this showed is that on the, uh, on the left there, the ordinary science intelligence, when they're presented with these, these controversial topics of global warming or fracking, you see the, the, the allegiance to that information go as you might figure, right? But for the people that showed high levels of scientific curiosity, they move stepwise, right? There's still a difference, that's to be assumed, but that's, that's someone that's learning. That's not someone that's walking away from information. They're wa walking towards it. And if you see that high intelligence, that, the more you know about a subject, the less likely you are to accept something radically different. No matter what that subject is, medicine is no different. Health, health is no different, right? So these peop the people that are, are arguing with us on, oh, I don't know, Facebook or whatever, it's not because they're stupid. They're actually probably pretty smart, certainly knowledgeable. And they're not, what they're lacking is not intelligence. It's a curiosity and an acknowledgement that, well, maybe I'm missing something, all right? So in practice, in summary, play the long game here, right? We, we tend to overemphasize over any single interaction, any single conversation, right? I got to get all my information out now. But how many times are you seeing patients or clients, six visits, eight visits, 12 visits, massage therapists you've seen for eight years, right? Do you need to get all that information out on day one? Is that valuable to your process? Or can you think out your information? Today I talked a little bit about those angry nerves that are, they really don't like what's going on in your elbow. And by day 12, you can be talking about all kinds of psychosocial issues and all kinds of interesting things that have already been made safe because you've made them trust you and you've, ex and you've trusted them. And now you have allegiance and alliance. Be consistent with your values. We're all healers, so heal. And don't come at someone with anger. And if they come back at you with anger, don't do it back. We don't do that with our patients. We don't do that with our loved ones, hopefully. Don't do that with people that disagree. Recognize their journey and recognize your own and be consistent with that. Because if you're saying one thing in the clinical floor, but doing something else when you turn on Facebook, you're at odds with yourself. And that's cognitive dissonance. And we need to prevent that in ourselves just as much as anyone else. Focus on finding gaps in knowledge, not ignorance of knowledge, right? Compliment them on what they do. They get people better, right? Does anyone doubt that? Maybe not for the reasons they think. And guess what? We probably don't get people better for the reasons we think either, right? So find gaps. But don't challenge. Don't say, well, this is completely wrong. Because what you're telling them is they're completely wrong. So just look for those small gaps where you can introduce the possibility of curiosity. Identify all opportunities to build confidence and trust. Work to create new ones. This starts for me as a physical therapist on my evaluation note to the physician. I talk about any indications that I might think for peripheral sensitization, for primary nociceptive, for whatever it is that I'm talking about. And what else I do is I say when I don't think it's those things. This patient does not appear to have central sensitivity. This patient appears to have, you know, regular healing. And I talk about all that because you don't want to be that pain person because then you're discarded, because then you're biased. So you want to be open. You want every opportunity to show what you do, including the stuff that's really similar. Because we get along with people that we get along with and that we agree with. And if there's a few disagreements, then you get curious about that. Gently lead, don't push. Remember the, the, the slide before with where they are in that continuum. If you get a pushback, just step back, right? Don't push back, just gently lead. Give them reasons to, to follow your lead and they'll come. If you're good enough or it's, or it's long enough in the game, they'll come. Live to fight another day because once you have that argument, you're done. And Unfortunately, I know it. I've made that mistake. And there are people that right now cursing my name somewhere, right? Don't do that. So live to fight another day. 
what's the harm? What are we concerned about? Do we think this patient will be broken? What's the problem? If a patient comes in with wrong beliefs, don't we deal with that anyway? So we don't have to have this amazing pushback of you're harming your patient, because that's a value. So I know if I think someone is harming one of my patients, that's a value that I believe in, but I also believe in helping others. I believe in spreading good information. So I should be consistent with those values too and not allow my worry or concern about harm to the patient. We'll get over it, so it'll take another visit or two to talk more about what they're going through. We do it already. There's no harm in playing that long game and having another opportunity to talk to someone that's resistant today but may be willing to listen tomorrow. So I'd like to finish with Daryl Davis. Daryl Davis is an amazing individual. Um, and I first heard about him on a radio interview, actually. Daryl Davis um, is an African-American man that has conversations with Ku Klux Klan members. Not just anyone, like the high dragon, whatever they are, right? The, the leaders of the Klan. And he went there not to change anyone's minds. He was curious. He said, why does someone hate me for the color of my skin that doesn't know me? So he set up these conversations. Now, what's, that's incredible, but what's more incredible is he's gotten some of them to quit the Klan. High dragons, whatever, whatever they are. <laughs> they, whatever, the magicians. So they've left the Klan because he's had conversations with them. Not trying to convince them that they're wrong, just asking them why they think they're right. So he talks about, give them a platform. You challenge them, but you don't challenge them rudely or violently. You do it politely and intelligently. And when you do things that way, chances are they will reciprocate and give you a platform. Right? The, the DJ that interviewed him said, you know, how do you do this stuff? Like, they must say the worst things about you. And he said, like what? They're going to talk about my race, my creed, my, my family, my mother, right? my intelligence. OK, I know that. And what he's doing is he's lowering his own threat. See, we get threatened by the information that we're not expecting. We get threatened by the information that contradicts what we think. But he's going in there saying, you can't harm me. Sticks and stones, man, right? So by doing that for himself, he's creating a better opportunity and a better environment to have dialogue. And then spontaneously through that dialogue, people with extreme beliefs came around. And he didn't even intend on doing it. So when you go back to your clinics, and you're that lone tree standing there, right? This was uh, Switzerland, actually. Um, Try these things out, right? Play the long game. See what type of communication you can develop. And it doesn't have to happen overnight, but eventually you can create a forest. Right? If you have more interest in this, three books that I would recommend. The Pain Chronicles is actually not necessarily about this, but it is a story of a, a chronic pain sufferer. It is a beautiful book to understand what our patients go through. Um, magnificent book. Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me is, is uh, um, book all about cognitive dissonance by one of the leading researchers. And The Righteous Mind um, is a phenomenal book in understanding more about why some of these values and what separates people not by intelligence, not by any of these things, but by the values that we hold. And we can find common ground in those values. So I'll leave you with the words of, of Gandhi. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a man changes, or a woman, his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards him. We need not wait to see what others do. And if that doesn't convince you, here's some more cats. <laughs> Thank you. I love your cats. Thanks, Great. man. So we've got about 15 minutes or so for some Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, put your hand up there. We can get a microphone over to you. We've got one right over here, far side on, uh, in the front row. And if somebody else has a question that you've got in mind, too, pop your hand up, too, and then I'll know where to send the microphone next. 
Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm Raven Trevilian. We've met online. We have. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry for whatever I said. <laughs> I am no. so sorry. No, no, I was your partner in crime, I would I know, say. I know, I know. <laughs> so this is a very interesting body of literature that I'm not familiar with, mm -hmm. and I've been taking notes to go home and read. But it seems to me that a lot of it focuses at the psychological level mm -hmm. of biopsychosocial. Yes. And when we're interacting with our peers and talking about what does it mean to be a member of our profession, mm -hmm. there's actually, it's more at a social level. And right. I'm wondering, have you come across any literature that addresses the more complex social level and of working with peers rather than patients? and colleagues? A, a lot of this literature, and I actually didn't look at the social levels, it, was, it, it tends from my, and uh, please don't comment from the experts in the back there, but um, the, all of this is absolutely entwined in where you are, in what environment, and, and how you express yourself within that environment with colleagues, with not. So it, you find that online, because if you're online, there's a world that could be watching. I better put up my best argument, right? So that's, there's a breakdown of communication. No wonder we all argue on Facebook because I'm getting likes, so I'm getting encouraged, right? Um, so that certainly doesn't help. Now to the specific of that question, I don't know. I don't know what environmental cues can do, positive or negative, but having said that, in the same way of biopsychosocial, can we create a safe environment, right? So are these conversations best had one-on-one -on -one or with their colleagues or, or whatnot as opposed to the gang coming in or is it best served in a group discussion where there's decorum, right? Can we set the stage for our discussion and social learning? So can we, like I said, in the beginning, I wanted to diffuse my own, you know, concerns about my expertise in the subject. So please, challenge it because then it diffuses me. So we can probably do things like that um, and bring in that social aspect of social cooperation and, and social acceptance by starting the stage with ourselves. Hey, thank you. There's, um, well, there, the first year that we had the summit, mm -hmm. Uh, there was a lot of people that were excited to be here because they're like, oh my God, back home, I'm the only one. Right. You know, and uh, so the, your image of, the, of that lone tree on the mm -hmm. windswept plain standing right. there, you know, like that really spoke to me. And, some, and something that, um, that, that we talked about was the idea of social nociception mm -hmm. and trying to minimize that when we're communicating right. with other people. Um, and so I was just wondering, You've given you've given a number of pieces of, of pieces of, of advice, mm -hmm. uh, but there we also there's will always be provocateurs. Yeah. Right. And so, if someone is a provocateur, mm -hmm. and let's say you agree 100 percent with what they're saying, right? But they've got a very different way of saying it that you can see is just not working. Right. How how do you address that? I mean, do you address yeah. that? Or, or, you know. He's so, talking about me. How do you relation? Uh, how, how do you, how do you, <laughs> well, uh, you, I'm related to the old you. Um, I think it, it, it goes in many ways the same way. It's just, it's, what are we describing? So are we describing someone that's giving pushback to our ideas? Yeah, right? I mean, but I'm a provocateur, so this is my identity. This is what I do, and, and I'm built up. I'm protecting something by doing that, right? By being provocative, and if you're not with me, you're against me. And that, that can work, and it just may not work the best way. So for, for sure, I, I know for a fact people have said, hey, thanks for all those arguments, man. They really helped change my mind. But I would, I would suggest that that could be a minority at this point. And I'm closing myself off to all the people that I pissed off, that, that wouldn't listen to a word I said, that turned off the, the feed as soon as I came on. And that's a shame, and that's my fault. So I think with any agreement, disagreement. We just talk about gaps. So for someone like that, it's like, oh, I, I love what you say, it's awesome. Do you get concerned about the people that, that don't buy in? See what they say. If they say, nah, man, I don't care, cool. Because they're not ready for that. But if they say, well, I mean, you know, I guess it'd be awesome if they weren't so closed-minded. Now we have an opportunity because you've expressed a gap in your knowledge. You've expressed interest. Well, I guess that would be okay. 
So we can read that conversation. And you can't always do that online. You just can't because words get misconstrued. I've been, I've been accused of all kinds of stuff that I didn't think I said, but I did because that was how it was interpreted because I pushed too far or I said the wrong thing. So we have to read the people that we're talking to and meet them where they are in the same way that we meet our patients where they are. And then we offer this journey so that we can both travel together. Would you speak to the difference between um, relating with or communicating with people online versus mm -hmm. in person? Because some people <sighs> seem to be very skilled with the oh, one yeah. and yeah. a very different skill set with the other. He's talking about me. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Notice how I'm trying to be really nice about that. <laughs> um, I mean, personally, I think, you know, <laughs> It's not, it's maybe, it's probably not controversial. The internet is it's the best worst thing ever, right? And so we're all here essentially because of the internet and they're all out there because of the internet, right? So it's, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, asking questions and active listening. We've seen amazing examples of active listening this weekend from these really skilled clinicians that, that really just little comments about how they interact with people. I don't see why that can't be done online. I don't see why you can't set the stage online and to recognize when someone is getting tense. We can see it because if you're going after them because they're tense, you know that they're tense. So we can choose to respond in a different way. So we can offer, you know, reach out to someone on a private message. Hey, I, I really liked what you were talking about and I, I just, do you have a second just, just for a question or I'd like to know more about your process. Invite them to, to educate you, right? That's, that's a, it's a marketing scheme actually. And it, I didn't do it on purpose, but that whole thing of, of you guys doing this for me, I'm a better person because you did me a favor. In your mind, there's a psychological bias to that. So I didn't do it on purpose. I actually just wanted to see you guys do that because I thought it was funny because I am still a troll. But, um, <laughs> but it, it, helps, it helps to create connection. When we see disconnect, we see other. When we see connection, we see peer group. We see a group, we see someone in group versus out group. And we respond differently to, in those environments, in those social environments. So we can do this online, you just have to tread carefully. And you have to be willing to step back and recognize that the, the conversation is not going in the direction that you want it to. So, have, so start, just like I, I suggested, start with your goals. What do I want to accomplish from this interaction? And if you don't see that happening, you step away. Hey, thanks so much for your time. I really hope we get to pick this up later. And then just live to fight another day. The, I don't know that, that online is that much different other than it compels us to be more aggressive and there's evidence that shows that. So if we can control that within ourselves, I can't control what someone else does in response, but I can certainly decide whether or not I want to be inviting or I want to be aggressive. And if I see that I'm not capable of that, capable of that then I back away. That's not the right environment for me. And go from there. We don't have to convince the whole world but it'd be sure nice to convince a few people that we work with and are close to us that we have shared interests and goals and we can learn from each other. When the, I'm sorry, was there a hand? Um, when we are online, and let's say uh, you, are, you, are sh you are blossoming from a troll into a unicorn, um, <laughs> and so you're, you know, but you still have a lot of troll friends. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you're like starting to make some new unicorn buddies. And let's say, let's say one of your new unicorn buddies is getting piled, dog piled. You know, a lot of, a lot of your troll friends are suddenly going after something that right, you, your right. unicorn buddy said or whatever. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you deal with that? Send them a message, right? Make that connection. I'm really sorry for that. I don't think that that's right. We may have disagreements, but I don't agree with that. Tell them that they have an ally, right? Aren't we doing, we're all trying to help people. They're trying to help people, help them to help people. So if there's a pile on, and you don't necessarily have to do that outwardly in the thread, you can, but then it may just get jumbled up. So let this person know that they have an ally. Hey, I don't agree with you, but I don't agree with this. And you're human too, and we can talk. And I'd love to know more about why you think this, right? 
and then let them be on your side, you be on their side, and don't worry about that. Right? We can't have that. We can't solve all the problems. We are aggressive <laughs> by nature, some of us, all right, me. But we can do stuff about it. We, we have choices. We just heard about pain as being a choice in some way, shape, or form that we can influence it, right? We can influence our behaviors if we learn the ways to do that. We can influence our behaviors too. So seek out those people that are getting really stuffed. And if they start to trust you and you have a great bond, eventually you start to share good information. And what's more important, that they get 100% of it or even just a little bit? Because that little bit that they told to that patient or that client or, or, or whoever, when you repeat it, they go, oh, yeah, I did hear something about that. So haven't we done a good job? I mean, I have a, we have a question, actually, right here. And after that, I've got a question for the audience. But we're gonna get, we'll get your question first. Uh, yeah, thanks for your talk today. It's already helping to make me think about ways that I can approach what I'm about to ask you. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, no, not, not what I'm about to ask you, but help with my, the interactions that I'm about to talk I'm about. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. <laughs> it's one thing to have a conversation with mm -hmm. peers, and, you know, they can or, in, you know, take that influence mm -hmm. or just go back to what they're doing. Um, how about with uh, physical therapy students, interns, where mm -hmm. they're looking to you yeah. to form what they're going to do. And, you know, let's say that, you know, they're coming from a program that's not that doesn't incorporate pain science and it just right. completely rocks their world. And, yeah. But I just learned this in school and you're saying posture doesn't matter or what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. That's, an, that's a fantastic question. And I'll go even a step further than that because I've, we have um, some wonderful new graduates in, in my clinic and they've actually been taught some of this stuff and they have no idea how to apply it. So it's almost worse, right? Because they get the information and now it's useless. So it's even worse, right? So what do you do? I say the same sort of thing. They're there to learn from you, so the stage is already set. And there may be pushback, but don't we sort of want that again? Do we want to convince someone that we're right, or do we want to learn, to have the opportunity to learn, to learn what they're teaching in their courses, to learn what your students' values are, and then to slowly show them the usefulness of the approach that you take? Right? If you're not getting results, why should anyone listen? So they're right there. They're primed to, to see what you're doing. And they heard this information, but is the information useful? If it is, then let's just reorganize it a little bit. And if it's not, let's have a huge discussion about it. But I think that, that sort of thing, again, it's the curiosity of it. So they come in being scared. <laughs> Make it safe. Let them be wrong. Let them have the opportunity to express their ideas and then have a polite conversation about it and fail them at the end. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question for the audience. Um, how many people are here for the first time? We had a lot, a lot of people. Like, you guys are the majority, OK? Now, uh, now whether you're here for the first time or second time, for how many of you would consider yourself a relatively new to pain science. Like you're still kind of getting a handle on it. Put your hands up high. There's no shame. You're here. Right. You're here with the big dogs, okay? And me. One, he's one of the big dogs. So that's a lot of you, okay? That's almost a third of the people in this room and probably even more people tuning in online. So when you've got, so, so you've got a, all these people that are relatively new with people that have been in the trenches for years and mm -hmm. years. How would you recommend to people that are relatively new to address some of these people that have been in it, that they're mm -hmm. just meeting, you know, or that they may even be nervous about meeting? Right, right. Keep it simple and keep it to your comfort level. Because again, we can't control what others will do, but we can control what we do. So if you have anxiety about this, I did too. You know, that's natural, it's normal. You're, you're, you're taking on information that you're probably not extremely comfortable with yet. So keep doing what you're doing. Don't stop, don't stop what you're doing and whatever techniques you're, you're part of using already, keep using those techniques. But just see if you can integrate a little bit. 
can you integrate some of this information? The manual approach that you use, hmm, I wonder if it's having any effect like, like what I heard and it's not having effect like what I thought. But what, it's, what it is doing, maybe having an effect. If the patient is getting better or the client is, is feeling better, then something's happening, right? So don't disregard any of it. Just when you don't find it useful anymore, then you can consider disregarding it. But if you find it useful, continue. And, and there are many roads to Mecca, right? Not just because I live in Saudi. Um, so <laughs> you can use these things, and it's not wrong. But what you should be is consistent. So if you're consistent with your beliefs, with the information that's being presented, and maybe some of this information is wrong, there's no doubt that in a weekend like this, some of this information is wrong. Unquestionably, in 10 years, in 20 years, something will have been wrong in a detail. It will have been less accurate. We'll have found something different. So that's, that's logical. That's rational. I know. Well, it's rational to say, I know not all of this is correct. It's also rational to say, at this point in time, I will use it because I don't know what is correct or incorrect. And that's learning. Right? So we can, we can take the information that we have and we can go forward with it. So when we're talking about the pros versus the newbies, we're all on a continuum. And so meet the individual where they're at, but most importantly, understand where you're at. Don't overextend yourself, but don't think that you can't have any conversation at all. Because if you have a good partner in communication, you have that opportunity. It doesn't matter where they're at. I think that brings us to the end of our Q&A time. Thank you very much.